And good morning, everyone. Welcome to Educational Leadership and Beyond Surviving and Thriving. My name is Andrew Murata. It is show number 30, and we are one day away from New Year's Eve 2017, going to be 2018 soon. Super pumped about that and super pumped about today's guest. I have on my best friend <laughs> from my whole childhood. I've known him since I'm five years old, Dr. Francis Sellis. Uh, Dr. Sellis is a cardiologist in Corvallis, Oregon. He hasn't always been out in Oregon. He was uh, my right-hand man for our 20 years of growing up together in Staten yeah. Island, New York. <laughs> Long time. Uh, so Dr. Sellis will be up in the uh, the next segment. Again, he's in studio here with us on Education, Leadership, and Beyond. Excited to get started uh, this morning. I do want to give a shout-out to Christine San Martino. She's a listener in Middletown, New York, and reached out to the program. She tunes in every Saturday. She's got her coffee. So, Christine, I appreciate you listening, and uh, you know, keep on it. That being said, let's get started. You can contact the program, andrew at neversinkmediagroup.com, via email or on Twitter, at andrewmarada21, uh, and on my website, andrewmarada.com. So as I said, I have my best friend on the show. He is a cardiologist now, Dr. Francis Sellis, and uh, I have two points for my opening concept. Number one are some lessons I've learned over my time with my good friend Francis. Uh, he's my best friend. We've had a lot of ups and downs together, and I just jotted down some uh, lessons I've learned from my, from my buddy. So number one, again, here on the uh, day before New Year's Eve, be a loyal friend. Francis has been so loyal to me, so good to me over the years, 37 years, uh, you know, and, and if you could say you have a, a friend like that, that you know your whole lifetime, you are blessed. So number one, be a loyal friend. Number two, invest in your family. Francis has always been family orientated with his uh, siblings, um, Mylan and Jeffrey in Staten Island and, uh, you know, his parents so close to uh, good Fredo and Ellen Sellis, his parents, just good people. Um, so invest in your family. Now he's got a family of his own, his wife, Maylene, uh, and his children, Ingrid and Baker, and, and always involved with activities with them. Um, so that's point number two, invest in your family. Number three, take risks. Francis, uh, over his lifetime, has had some calculated risks that have paid off. He traveled up from Staten Island, New York, to Bronx High School, uh, the Bronx High School of Science. Uh, you know, an hour and change, an hour and a half, almost two hours commute to go up to that high school. I have a hard time getting kids to school that live down the block. And he uh, traveled from Staten Island to the Bronx on public transportation every day. Moving out to Corvallis, Oregon, almost eight years ago, uh, again, some might consider a risk, uh, but it was a family decision, and uh, we believe a, a good decision. Even when we were younger, Francis was always the first one to maybe ask a girl to dance or uh, you know, just a little more confident me, than me out there on the soccer field uh, and with the ladies um, you know, over time. Number four, if you want something in life, you have to work at it. Francis spent many, many years in medical school. He always was working at his uh, favorite hobby, playing soccer, and really his schooling. He was always an excellent student, putting a lot of time in. Uh, but just that commitment to go to that high school that him and his family thought was the best and uh, that time he put in there, not only in the travel, but in his study. So if you want something in life, you have to work at it. And number five, be nostalgic. Francis, uh, again, when he travels back to the East Coast, again, nice enough to come up and see us here in Orange County, New York, and uh, Milford, Pennsylvania area. But I know he will hit his favorite pizzerias in Staten Island, uh, his family home, and uh, kind of relive some of the memories from his childhood, bringing his children there. And uh, Francis remembers the past fondly. And, uh, you know, thinks about those times and shares that again with his family. So those are some lessons that I learned from my, my good friend. And I'm so excited that he's on the program today. 
Um, but the second concept I wanted to talk about uh, with, with Francis, and, and we're going to get into this on the air a little bit in our next segment, is about him being a doctor. And we've all had some doctors that have made a positive impact on our life and made us feel really special and we connected with. And then maybe we have had doctors that didn't have the best bedside manner or the best uh, interactions with their patients. Malcolm Gladwell writes about this in the book Blink. And uh, Gladwell is a best-selling author. Uh, and he writes about the concept of why some doctors get sued and why others don't. And someone might think that doesn't know this or, you know, someone might think, well, the people that make the mistakes are the ones who get sued. And Gladwell writes uh, in one of the opening chapters called The Theory of Thin Slices, Gladwell writes that it really has nothing to do with the amount of mistakes. It has to do with the doctor's relationship with his patients, how the doctor treats the patients. Gladwell writes in the book about a study where a researcher, Wendy Levinson, recorded the time in the office that the doctor spent with the patient. So after uh, going through this research and after uh, studying this, Gladwell writes about several points about why some doctors get sued and why others don't. Again, in that key concept, it doesn't have to do with the amount of mistakes that the doctor makes. It has to do with the doctor's uh, relationship with the patient. And that starts with, number one, the amount of time the doctor spent with the patient. Levinson found in her research that the doctors who got sued less spent about 18.3 minutes with the patient, while the doctors got sued more spent uh, 15 or less minutes. A second thing they learned about these interactions in the doctor's office, the doctor who talked less and listened more was more or less likely to be sued. Again, the doctor that talked less and listened more. Third, when the doctor was uh, an active listener, they would make comments like, I understand, or tell me more about this symptom, or tell me why you think you're feeling this way. And the doctor would be an active listener. These were, again, key concepts to why some doctors got sued and others didn't. The ones that were more active listeners were less likely to get sued. The last thing, they, the, the researcher even went further. They did some audio on the voices and they did some tone recognition. The doctor that talked in a, uh, a, a tone that was dominant over the patient was more likely to be sued. So they checked on the tone of the doctor. And we learned, uh, again, when we were kids, right? It's not what you say, it's how you say it. And really, that was Gladwell's concept about this uh, topic that it was how the doctor talked to the patients. I'm going to read just a, a small snippet. It's on page 41. If you have this book, it's called Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, number one, when they were talking about not being sued, um, the person said, you know, we, think, we don't think the doctor was negligent. It was your primary care doctor who is at fault. And the client would say, I don't care what she did. I love her and I'm not suing her. That was a positive effect. And, and then here's a negative one. This is a client talking to a lawyer about a, a fault. In our first meeting, she told me she hated the doctor because she never took the time to talk to her about her other symptoms. She never looked at me as the whole person, the patient said. When the patient had a bad medical result, the doctor has to take time to explain what happened and to answer the patient's questions, to treat them like a human being. The doctors who don't do this are the ones who get sued. It isn't necessary then to know how a surgeon operates in order uh, to know the likelihood of being sued. What you need to understand is the relationship between the doctor and his patients. So I wanted to share that concept with you. Again, that was from the book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. Because in studio, coming up in the next segment, I have my best friend. I've known him for almost 40 years, Dr. Francis Sellis. And I know Francis uh, inside and out. I might say to his wife, I might know him better than you. We'll see. We'll have to fight that out. Uh, but Francis has a terrific bedside manner. He is a gentleman. He's got a warm smile. 
And, uh, you know, I hope he never uh, does get sued in his time as being a doctor. But I know he has developed relationships with his patients. Uh, I know he treats them with respect and uh, in a warm, uh, respectful and gentle manner. So he's coming up next on Education, Leadership and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. We'll be right back with today's guest, my good friend, Dr. Francis Sellis. Welcome back to the program, everyone. This is Education, Leadership and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. It's a New Year's show. Excited uh, on as we're getting ready for New Year's Eve here. Uh, tomorrow, just a day away. But more excited right now to welcome in today's guest, my best friend I grew up with my whole life, uh, and he's all grown up now. He is a cardiologist, uh, and he's currently practicing and living in Corvallis, Oregon. Dr. Sellis, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the invitation. You traveled cross, cross country to That's make, right. make it here in studio. That's right. Coast to coast. Coast to coast to see my best friend. Doc, uh, again, I'm so proud of you uh, that I could call you a, a doctor. And uh, let's get right into it, Doc. You know, Corvallis. H- how did you get to Corvallis uh, out there to be a doctor? How did that whole uh, story happen? Well, you know, actually, it was kind of a, a mistake, actually. I went out there to interview for another kind of training. I wanted at the time to be a interventional cardiologist. This is a type of cardiologist and a physician that does invasive procedures to open up blocked arteries in the heart if you're having a heart attack, that sort of thing. And they, they're more procedural based than a more general physician. They had a fellowship, or at least they had the startings of a fellowship out there on the West Coast in Corvallis. And when I went to go interview there, it turned out that they weren't really fully formed with that program yet. But they said, hey, we have an opening for cardiologists. Why don't you just come out and check it out and see if that's something you might enjoy. So on a whim, we had never been out there. So my wife and I packed up and we went for an interview there just to check it out. And it turned out to be a perfect fit for the kind of lifestyle we wanted. So when I think about Corvallis and and the reason why we went out to the West Coast out here from New York, New Jersey, it was really because of what they had to offer me as a program and what they had to offer me as a physician, the kind of lifestyle I wanted to live was something that was different in the West Coast than it was on the East Coast, for instance. I'd interviewed a lot lot of different programs here on the East Coast and a lot of different kinds of practices, but one of the things that they had offered me out there that they didn't as much here was time. And what I've come to realize throughout my training and throughout my life is that the most valuable thing that you have is not actually money. It's not how much money you're offered. It's not how much money you make or your gauge of success, it's really your time is the most valuable thing you have. And if you're able to to do something where they're able to offer you a little bit more time with the things that you want to do, whether it be your family or a hobby, then that's that was very important to me at the time. It's the reason why we went out there in the first place. And you grew up watching your parents uh, hustle, both being doctors, oh, yeah. serving the, the community and, and their hospitals and always coming and going. And, and that had an impact on you. Yeah, it really did. I, you know, as immigrants, they, they came here from the Philippines right out of medical school, started their training right in, uh, in the New York City area and uh, became full time physicians in Brooklyn and Staten Island. And uh, they had to work hard. You know, they had to stay up late. They came home late. They left early. They took call. And my memories from my mother, who was an OBGYN, most of the time in my childhood was her asleep because she would often come to back home after these 36-hour, 48-hour shifts and just have nothing left, nothing left in the tank. But, you know, they made the time that they had with us count, and that was important in my upbringing. But it's also something that growing up, I'm like, when I have kids, when I come home, I want to spend time with them, and I want to be awake for their childhood. And uh, that really affected me, and I I think that came into the decision also of moving. Moving from home, it was very difficult. New York is an incredible place. It will always be my my home in my heart, but but that's something that, that wasn't able to be offered to me at the time. So you use the word lifestyle out in, in Oregon. And, and so how is it different, Fran? You know, a lot of us here on the East Coast, wow. we, you know, a lot of hustle and bustle. Yeah, and, and uh, but absolutely. What are the biggest differences you, you see? You're out there eight years now. 
Yeah, you know, growing up in New York is great. You know, you, being alive in the city and even just in the East Coast in general, whether it be in New York, New Jersey, uh, uh, even parts of Pennsylvania where we were, you know, where we grew up, it, it's still this sort of East Coast vibe where it's sort of this hustle and bustle. We got to, you know, what, whatever we're doing, we got to do it faster. We got to do it more efficient. And we, we're already late if we're on time. That's sort of kind of uh, level of, of hard work, work ethic, it's really important. Uh, but I think in the West Coast, they, they still have and they still value sort of this work-life balance a little bit more than they do in, in New York. So the vibe is very different on the West Coast. The vibe is just more like very chill, uh, very like a slower pace of life. It's good and it's bad. There's some things that I can't stand. They drive terribly slow <laughs> all over the West Coast, except in LA. They can, when they can drive, drive they drive fast. But when they, when they don't, uh, like in Oregon, they they drive way too slow. That's that's the only thing. Can't can't take that. <laughs> that that got Gavin's attention. Yeah. We have that problem on the East Coast as well. <laughs> I guess you do. I mean, no, the other thing is a road etiquette, right? I mean, I don't know. You, you grow up on the East Coast. You're like, all right, the, the fast lane is for the fast people. The slow lane is for the slow people. And, and the middle lane is for somewhere in between. And I don't know why, but in Oregon, they feel a need to, to police everyone in the fast lane. And we're going at the speed limit in the fast lane. But but uh, that that's the only that's one of the few things that I, that I don't like about the West Coast and then the East Coast. There's other things that don't uh, drive in the East Coast. It drives you crazy too. You know, it's just like way way too fast sometimes. But what are you gonna do? <laughs> now, Fran, uh, talking a little uh, medical here. You know, Gavin not wanted to ask a question. I do want you to share uh, that story that we spoke about in our pre-show meeting. But but Gavin, you had a good question uh, uh, regarding the heart of. The following three forms of substance abuse, some would argue that tobacco isn't, okay, but of drugs, alcohol, and tobacco, of those three, which would you say are the most dangerous to your heart and why? I think that each one of those groups has some danger to both your heart and to your, to your health in general, but I think by far smoking is the worst in terms of cardiovascular health. And so when someone comes to us, if you had to rank, what kind of order would you, would you stop or cease things to improve your health? It has to be smoking. You know, decreasing the amount of smoking decreases significantly your risk of cardiovascular and overall uh, cardiovascular disease and overall disease. And so the first thing that someone comes that I say to who comes to my office who's still smoking is you got to quit smoking before you do anything else. Before you lose weight, before you, you know, all of these things are important. Control your blood pressure, control your sugars. If you have high sugars or, and or diabetes, is to stop smoking because that will reduce your heart disease risk almost immediately. So, Fran, how do you, how do, you do that? You heard the opening segment where we talked about your bedside manner. You know, let's say you have a, right. a stubborn Italian from New York <laughs> that comes in there. Hey, you ain't gonna tell me, how, you know? Yeah. How do you? No, I actually love that. I love when patients from the East Coast. That's that's another thing. I like. I love. There are a lot of explants on the West Coast. So these New Yorkers are like, hey, how you doing? And I love. I had always imagined that I could take care of those patients, the the, the people that we grew up with. But uh, yeah, you, you know. The bedside manner is important. Establishing relationships, meeting people halfway is so important. And it's so so interesting that you brought up Blink and Malcolm Gladwell's book because in this time right now that there's so many things at odds with spending more time and listening to your patient, you know, it's so important to establish relationships with patients. And yet there are these other forces that are pulling physicians and administrators and and nurses in different directions to be more efficient and to see more patients and to to do it so more efficiently that I feel like a lot of times you're stuck with looking at a computer more than you're looking at the patient or you start typing away rather than really listening to the patient. And it's a difficult thing because we're, we're different forces are pulling us in different directions. We want to take care of patients, yet we want to be more efficient. We don't we want to provide quality care, yet we don't want the hospital to fold because we haven't seen enough patients or, or delivered care to enough people. So right now, the challenge is to strike a balance. How do you provide good quality care to patients, help them 
make them feel like they're listened to and actually listen to them, yet stay on track, stay on time, and somehow get home in some sort of reasonable hour where you can live your life. That, that remains to be the challenge. And Fran, I know you go for a lot of professional development and you, you're always training, you're always learning new techniques, but is that something that your hospital or your medical group talks to you about, about you know, your bedside manner and the way you treat the patients? Is that something they stress to you? Yeah, you know, it's a funny thing. Uh, you know, out of all of our our measures that the, the hospital cares about, it's like two separate things. We get these surveys, which I think are super important, and it's really great to get this feedback from patients about, do you feel like your doctor was on time? Do you feel like you were listened to? Do you feel like all your questions were answered? And it's great to get that kind of feedback, but it's also very different from the hospital the feedback we get from our hospital administrators who who are more concerned with kind of keeping the lights on and making sure that that although patient care is first and it has to be delivered in an efficient manner that we're able to remain afloat maintain some semblance of of keeping the lights on because a lot of a lot of hospitals if you just solely rely on that and really stick to your guns and, and, and force, like, I have to spend this amount of time with these patients and provide this level of care, it, it's difficult because the reimbursements are getting lower, Medicare and health care is going crazy, so we have to figure out some way to, to cut costs and del- still deliver care without, without compromising people's personal health, yet keeping the business model afloat so that you can actually keep the lights on. It's difficult. Fran, we, we mentioned your father uh, earlier, and you know, unfortunately, in, in you know, '06, you lost your dad to a, a, a head-on car collision, a terrible, right? Yeah, you know, and your dad, good Fredo Sellis, Coach Sellis, <laughs> was always so My good dad. to me. So many stories, uh, your father, all the Mets games, uh, the McDonald's. One of the things I remember, and you know I don't remember a lot with that concussion, <laughs> but you, your dad used to schedule whether it was only one an hour or one every half hour, and his secretary and even your mom, I think, were like, yo, you got to schedule some more people. <laughs> you, you know, and, but your dad valued that time with the patient. Am I right? Right, right. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's something that was very important to him to make sure that each patient had the the amount of time that he felt necessary for them to tell their own story, to provide a good level of care. He did that for 30 years, did a great job with it, and it, 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 he, he was able to practice in a time where he called his own shots, he was his own boss, he was a private practitioner, he was a neurologist, and he was able to see as many or as few patients as he, as he wanted, and I think that that's something although that the private practice model is something that is becoming more and more difficult to practice was that was a, well, one of the great things about private practice it's like you have to call the shots if you want to spend an hour with the patient spend an hour with the patient and keeping the lights on is something le- that was sort of less of a a concern if you're not an employee of a hospital system then then making money or 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 reimbursement that all took care of itself because you know you you wanted to practice a certain way, and you're happy with what reimbursement you get. Doctor, great answer. We do have to take a break here, uh, and I do. When we come back, I want to ask you some more questions about your dad uh, and some of the lessons you learned from your dad. So we'll be right back on education, leadership, and beyond surviving and thriving with today's guest. Dr. Francis Sellis. Welcome back, everyone. This is Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. My name is Andrew Murata, host of the show, and we're going to get right back to today's guest, Dr. Francis Sellis. Dr. Sellis is my childhood friend, uh, and that we've grown up together, and even though we're on opposite sides of the United States, uh, we are still uh, very close, and I appreciate you making the time to be here in studio. Doc, we ended uh, talking about your dad, uh, and unfortunately, you know, you tragically lost your father uh, in a car accident. You know, what were some other lessons besides that time of, uh, you know, making time for the patients and, and really valuing their time? What were some other lessons you learned from your father? Well, oh, man, to, to nail it down to one or two things is very difficult. He taught me everything I know. But one thing you probably remember about the guy is no matter what the situation is and how serious it is, don't forget to laugh. 
I think that life is short and you have to enjoy it. And as far as happiness is concerned, we get into this rut where we're like, well, if I go to school a few more years, then I'll be happy. Or if I get this job, then I'll be happy. Or if I get this promotion, then I'll be happy. But no, it has to be right now. If your mind is functional enough to understand what happiness is and contentment, then you should be happy. There, there's happiness right now for everyone. And so no matter what situation you find yourself in, as hard as it may be, and it can be very hard, obviously, right now, if you your mind is functioning, you should be happy right now. And that's, that's probably the most important lesson that he taught me. I remember we'd always joke that if I ever did stand-up comedy, I was offering your dad a front ticket. <laughs> yeah, in row. he will laugh at anything. <laughs> He'll think the the most uh, mundane things are funny. So, but uh, we had so many good times. For all those Mets fans that are listening out there, oh yeah, the Sellers family uh, had season tickets, and man, we used to drive from Staten Island, sit on that BQE, and we sat went sat on that BQE longer than we were at the game, man. So many uh, games, eighty six Mets. Oh uh, yeah, but your dad, uh, you know, took me to you know, just so many games, so many fond experiences I, when I take my son and my daughters to games now we we play catch on our way to the there seat. you go you know there you go um, I remember we threw one of those balls into the bullpen <laughs> by mistake remember that David Cohn and the group was in there oh man it's yeah. a good thing it didn't hit him but Fran you you traveled cross country two years ago when the Mets were in the World Series All right and and took your brother to a game you know and that was a, a, a real important thing to you. You know, what what made you do that? Well, you know, because my dad, he took us to all those games. I, you know, I, I don't know in a way they're playing if they'll ever get in the World Series again. So when when they hit the World Series that that one time, it's like, oh, we, we got to go see this. Not to mention one of the players, Conforto, he was a Oregon State University player. So we had to see him, and we have to shout out to the Beavers. That's the town I live in now. So... It was great. It was great to take my brother. I felt my, like my dad was right there watching that game. Uh, it was great. And the, the opening concept, you know, writing those lessons I learned from you about investing in your family and, and you know, being nostalgic. Those memories, even today, I, I, when, I, when I put the Mets on, I, I think of that. You know, yeah, absolutely. He, he would, anybody who walked by, the hot dog, the popcorn, <laughs> yeah, we'll take three. You yeah. Know, it's just... Yeah. I mean, you gotta go to a game. The, the hot dogs just taste better at the game. So <laughs> we, I don't know. That's the only one. That's one thing. The only Yankee Stadium had better than ours. Our hot dogs were so-so. <laughs> I, I really, I really believe that. I had a hot dog in, in Yankee Stadium, and it just tasted better. But, but there's something about being at a baseball game that makes the hot dogs taste better. Absolutely. And Fran, another uh, one of the things we talked about in the opening concept is that you always valued education. You know, you, you've always been a student and, and, and someone who's learning. You made that decision to travel over an hour each way to the Bronx High School of Science. And, you're, you know, you're 13, 14 years old when you did that. What Do you remember what went into that decision? Well, at the time, I, I really didn't know too much about what I was getting into. I mean, I was just a kid. But I knew the, the, the education out there, the kind of opportunities that, that we were getting, and the concept of, of the Bronx High School of Science and a lot of the other specialized public schools is something that I wanted to be a part of. You know, these are these inst educational institutions that give everyone a free shake. It, it was very important to me, even at that time, I, I wanted to, to be in a place that, that anyone from the city, all you had to do was be from the city, New York City, take a test, you make the grade you're in, you, you don't make the grade, you, you're not quite ready yet, you can take the test again, and if you show some grit and you want to take it again, you can. I, I, I really like that. They don't care how much money you're from, the money you have, where you're from, who you are, what color you are, what you believe in, what you don't believe in. Like, you make a grade, you work hard, you do well and you're in. Uh, I love that concept. It's something that I think is, is is a valuable thing to have and it's getting sort of pushed, I think, to the side a little bit in our society and I don't know why that is, but um, but it's something that I it was really important to me and something I wanted to be a part of. You know, you mentioned that word grit and I think that added to you and, you know, just the traveling and the, you know, the, the concept and then you left 
uh, Bronx High School Science. You went on to Johns Hopkins. Right. Did, did you have a good experience there? Did you enjoy Hopkins? Yeah, I, I that was that was a different level of <laughs> academics altogether. That was a, a very very more, much more of like a, a pressurized environment, kind of a sink or s- swim kind of place. But uh, I, I enjoyed my time there. It's the the kind of education you got there it prepared me for for the rest of my life, and um, I, I'm appreciative to everything that 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 it represented and everything that it gave me. Fran, we are uh, pre-recording this show, um, but we are just a day away from New Year's Eve. You know, 2018, uh, as you and I have talked about when we were, you know. Little kids together playing in the schoolyard, and here we are on a radio program <laughs> together. You know, what are you looking forward to in 2018? And not necessarily what's your resolution, but, you know, what is something that, that is a goal of yours or, or something that you're looking forward to this coming year? Well, I think what we, we harken back to before is just this whole process. This, you know, we, we grew up together. We have certain, we've achieved certain things in our lives that, that, I, that we're both proud of, and how do you continue to do that? How do you continue to improve as a person? If it's in your personal craft, you just try and be a better whatever it is that you are. For me, it's to be a, a, as good a physician and father. Those are the two things that I like to do and um, I have a passion for. And how do I work on doing that? How do you always improve? There, There's no, you know, this this whole thing is, this whole idea of life, I think, is something that, you always want to improve, get better, no matter what it is, and and keep on progressing. So for this next year, how do I do that? How do I become a better doctor? How do I be a better listener? How do I learn a little bit more? How do I spend more time with my kids? How do I improve um, their progress and their growth as well, both just mental and physical, just how do I make things better for them? And uh, that's what I want to focus on next year. So how do you do that, Fran, specifically? Are you a reader? Do you listen to podcasts? Uh, do you go to professional developments? You know, this show is called Education, Leadership, and Beyond, and that is uh, one of the facets of leadership, I believe, is, is a continual uh, improvement. So right. how do you physically do that? Well, one of the things I like to do, you mentioned like medical education. It's something that you attend conferences, you get better, you talk to people, when I chose, when I choose kind of what I want to do with my year and how I want to split up the time that I have, I, I like to combine things together. If I'm going to a conference and I want to learn something new about my, my craft, I want to have balance and, and, and invite my family to come with me so that for part of the day I can, I can learn a little bit something more about cardiology, but for the rest of the day I want to spend it with my family and enjoy a, like a new place with them. So how do you combine, how do you use your time effectively? How do you combine the things that you want to achieve professionally with what you want to achieve personally? And I think that that's something that that is important to to try and do. And you've shared those pictures of of all over the country you've been and you (laughs) texted me in in Hawaii. Yeah, I'm in a conference in Hawaii. Like, oh, look at this. Like, well, sometimes, you know, sometimes you want to improve one more than the other. (laughs) If you go to Hawaii, maybe you want to spend more time with your family than you want to pick up a few things about cardiology, right? It's a great concept, though, Fran. And it it really, you know, it is a that life work balance, uh, which leads right into my next question. This is a challenging question. We've had several guests, uh, some high power people. They've (laughs) taken passes at this next question. So um, you mentioned your job and your family. You mentioned your cardiology and being a great father and husband, you know, but besides your job and your family, what is something that you are most proud of? Besides my job and my family. What am I most proud of? Hmm. We ask that question in interviews, and uh, yeah. Well, just just lately, you you mentioned this earlier on, and uh, is that what I want to do with my free time? I guess if it's not my work and with my family, what what do how do I spend my time? What how do I unwind? And so when we were in grade school together, I started playing playing soccer, and for a lot of time, for a long time after that. It, 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 you know, I, I, I didn't play the sport. I didn't really like follow the sport. But for some reason, m- much more recently, in the last few years, I kind of rediscovered it, and 
I think that it's it's a a great thing to do to spend time on like physical health. I'm really bored with just running on a treadmill. I think that exercise is really important, and so I joined a men's league and am able to sort of unwind and exercise for an hour, or two to three times a week with my friends, and sort of develop as a soccer player and develop exercise without having to work <laughs> at it. You know, you don't have to think about how how far you've traveled on a treadmill if you're running down soccer balls trying to beat somebody else so I think that that's that's something that I'm proud of is just incorporating uh, this sport I've revisited it over now and rediscovered it after starting it off as a kid and um, I, I really appreciate that as part of being part of my life now USA didn't even make the World I know, Cup this year. I know. I have my come own on. opinions about that. Come but. on. Uh, yeah, they fired the coach. Uh, you know. Well, you know, the players are on the field, and I think that their mind was already in Russia. You know, they're already thinking that, that they're there, and that's it's it's a humbling game. You know, soccer, you know, really, it's a very humbling game. If you, if you are not, if you're not hum- humble, then it's hard to win. <laughs> I know your son, uh, my godson Baker, is a big time player sure. uh, as well. Fran, we are up against uh, the rapid fire portion of the program. All right, let's do this. And uh, people get excited about it. So these are rapid fire answers. Uh, quick, whatever comes to your mind. Okay. Are you I'm, ready? <laughs> I'm not ready, but let's do this. Is this more stressful than a heart surgery? <laughs> uh, you know, Probably. You know, I mean, there's a lot Probably. of pressure here. You know, we got uh, we got uh, um, ah, I got, we got Christine San Martino listening today. She okay. wants to hear. All your right, here we go. Questions. Here best, we go. Best thing about living in Oregon: the vibe, the vibe, the people. The best thing about the West Coast: also the laid, back, also the laid back lifestyle. I'd say. Favorite Met of all time: Oh, Gary Carter, the kid, the kid, the kid died of cancer. Yeah, you know, yeah, sad. Yeah, fast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Favorite Filipino tradition? Hmm. Uh, this, this cultural dance called tinikling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> pizza or Filipino food? Pizza. Ooh, Definitely pizza. Ooh, the family's going to be <laughs> upset. Reason why you and I have stayed friends for over 37 years? Um... I don't know. It's just, I don't know, love, man. <laughs> Feel the love, bro. Feel it. Besides the heart, which body part are you most intrigued with? This is a, a PG show here. <laughs> don't be, uh, you know, don't be. I'd have to go with the brain. Oh, yeah. In your father's. Uh, there you go, yeah. in my father's footsteps. Neurology. Last uh, book you read. Uh, non like heart like uh, you know two. textbook. Oh it, it, well, there's two like that. I read them kind of in the same time. There's disillusionment, disillusionment of the American physician, which is a great book written by a cardiologist, mm-hmm. and uh, Modern Romance by Aziz Ansari. Those are two great books, especially the Modern Romance. It's a very nice book. Isn't he the actor? Yeah, he's yeah. a comedian actor. Yeah. You like yeah. the comedians? I do. Yeah. Was it Modern what? Modern Romance, Aziz Ansari. It's a great right, book. Yeah. Last movie you saw? Just saw Star Wars last night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no spoilers, but good movie. Good Ten movie. is the best, one's the worst. What do you give it? Uh, nine. Whoa. Yeah. It's not a ten, but it's I you know, for Star Wars man, it's definitely a nine. May the force be with yeah. you, my friend. <laughs> Favorite thing about me that you like to make fun of? Oh, man, there's so many. <laughs> Which one should I pick? I don't know. Ah, uh, you've been a part of a lot, a lot of them. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I I know when you got that concussion. I you fell off of a fence in Oof. front of your aunt Jenny's house. I don't remember no, it. aunt Miriam's house. I don't remember that. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, I you think fell off a chain link fence. I think your dad helped me out. I yeah, think I got some free uh, neurology. Yeah, business. there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, Doc. We are up against the commercial break. Uh, he's doing a great job today. This is Doctor Francis Sellis here on Education Leadership and Beyond surviving and thriving welcome back to the program everyone education leadership and beyond surviving and thriving my name is andrew Murata, and it's show number 30 with my good friend dr francis sellis we'll be right back with dr sellis but a quick recap 
we introduced the concept called a warm smile. We talked about Dr. Sellis's bedside manner, the way he interacts with patients. Uh, we talked about the book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell and his concept of thin slicing and how some doctors get sued and some doctors don't, and it really has nothing to do with the amount of mistakes that the doctor makes. It has to do with their relationship with the patients. The doctors that got sued less spent more time with the patients. They talked less to the patients and listened more, and they were an active listener. They made comments like, I understand, and tell me more about that. And lastly, they didn't talk down to the patients. They were on the same level and made the patients feel comfortable. I also talked about Francis and some of the lessons that I've learned from Francis over the years. Being a loyal friend, investing time with your family, taking risks. If you want something in life, you have to work at it, and being nostalgic. Francis loves to uh, remember the, the fond things of our childhood and, and uh, growing up in Staten Island, New York. He's gone on pizza tours around the, <laughs> the, the neighborhood. We're going again. That's right. That's right. I might have to join you this yeah, time. Yeah, definitely. So let's bro welcome Dr. Sellis back in. Doc, this is a write-in portion of the show. You can contact the program on Twitter at Andrew Murata 21 You can email in Andrew at NeverSyncMediaGroup.com. Or you could contact me through my website, andrewmarada.com. So, Doc, we have two questions uh, for you today. Number one, uh, what would you give a high schooler or an eighth grader uh, who might be thinking they want to go to medical school? You knew uh, as a youngster that, that you wanted to go in the medical field, and you made that decision to go to Bronx High School of Science. But uh, for a high schooler or, again, a seventh and eighth grader who might be thinking about medical school, what advice would you give them? I'd have to say the most important thing that you can do from high school is to just have a passion for what you're going after and more than just passion about a, a topic. I think it's this concept that you had mentioned about grit. And you know, once you get up to the higher levels of education and then medical training, it, it really comes down to that. I think that education is really important. It's really important to understand and have medical knowledge. That's an important thing. But it's more important to have uh, a drive and determination because it takes more than that if you want to be successful, just not as a physician, but just in life in general. You have to have grit. You have to keep coming back and not be bothered by failure. And failure turns out to be really important as a teacher. And I think that you learn... I agree with this completely. You learn more from your failures than you do from your successes. So if you can sort of keep at it, those are the people that, that you would want as your doctor. Everyone at that level, I think, has a certain degree of intelligence, and that's really important. But beyond that, if they have the determination to be a, a better doctor and a better physician and more caring, then that, that's more important to me. And uh, that's what you should do as a student. Excellent. Uh, Francis, this is a uh, question that you know you can't really answer in two minutes. So do the best you okay. can. Um, but you know, healthcare is a major topic in this country, and it, 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 you know, going through whenever I go to the hospital for a procedure or something, it's like, oh, the, you know, the copay and the insurance and like the amount of paperwork is just it's just unbelievable. Right. You know, um, you just your thoughts. You know, if if you had a President Trump's ear, and you could talk to him about health care as a, as a practicing cardiologist. You know, what would be your recommendation to, to try to fix this health care issue? Wow. So how to fix health care in two minutes, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm of the camp that I, I really do think that, that health care is a right, and I think that all citizens of the United States should have some form of health care one way or the other, and if one isn't able to be afforded. If you can't afford health care, then somehow it should be provided. Um, but um, I don't know. What, what is the right thing? Is it to, to just have an open market and have insurances and see what you can afford or what you can't or have a completely subsidized government single-payer system? I don't really have the answer to that. I think it's probably some mixture of both where people who are, are more 
uh, who have less resources, less financial resources, can be afforded some form of of insurance. And um, while people who can afford it or have uh, a well structured um, insurance program from their job can can have that too or enjoy that too and add on if they as they feel necessary. I don't know. That's my two minute answer. F- fixing the healthcare issue in two minutes. That's right, Doc. We just we have a couple <laughs> extra minutes, and it's not every day. We have a cardiologist on the program, <laughs> right. and uh, we have a wide-ranging audience here on Education Leadership and Beyond. Sure. I know a lot of my high schoolers tune in every Saturday. Uh, again, people like Christine San Martino tuning in <laughs> at coffee time on Saturday morning. There you go. Um, but with, with the holidays, Thanksgiving to Christmas, there is a lot of eating, a lot of <laughs> drinking, uh, a lot of excess. You know, if someone might be concerned about their heart and, and they, you know, what would be a symptom that, you know, someone who doesn't pay a lot of attention to their medical needs and maybe, you know, trying to ignore things, they don't like to go to a doctor's, but if someone's having an issue with their heart, and I know this might be too general of a question, but what is a symptom that, that they could feel? Like I always, you know, heard like a heart attack, you, you get a numbing feeling in your right. arm, your left arm, your right arm, I don't know, but like what's a, what would be a symptom like, like a red flag for the heart? Well, there, there's, there's a few things, right? The, the classic way that people describe a heart attack or uh, what's called a myocardial infarction is this heaviness that rather than true sharp pain in the left side of your chest with radiation to your left arm and maybe your jaw. And it feels like a squeezing sensation, like an elephant sitting on your chest. And that's a very classic description of a heart attack. And it turns out that that is actually not the most common way that I usually see people with heart attacks presenting. It's a classic way, but oftentimes it could be something like a sensation of indigestion or or discomfort. Most people who actually present with heart attacks, in my experience, when I ask them truly in the hospital, what are you feeling right now? What what does this feel like? They say, well, it's something in my chest that I can't really describe. It's, it's sort of, <laughs> that, that's the most common, common actually answer that I get. Sometimes it feels like a pressure, but other times not. And there are other su- subgroups of patients that don't really feel these classic symptoms as much. If you happen to be diabetic, the symptoms of heart attack might be masked um, and might not be classic. So it could be much more like a shortness of breath feeling or or, or more of a pressure uh, feeling than, than true chest pain. And also middle-aged and older women may present with atypical symptoms that don't aren't really described by these more classic symptoms of chest pressure radiating to the left arm, but might represent some kind of of um, atypical symptom, whether it be shortness of breath or a sharp pain or discomfort on the other side of the chest. These are symptoms that that, that might feel um, if and might be heralding some kind of heart condition. Well, thanks, Doc. You're giving out free medical advice <laughs> here on the program. Fran, we're out of time. Uh, we're, we're, we're at the end of the program, uh, but it means a lot to me that, that you were able to come in studio here, so I really wanted to sure, say thank yeah, you. This is awesome. <laughs> you had a good time? Thanks for, thanks for having me. This has been uh, really, really cool and uh, uh, an experience that I won't forget. This is awesome. Well, and thanks for tuning in, everyone. Here's a quote. We end our show uh, with a quote, and we're, we're ending uh, 2017. We're, we're up against New Year's uh, Eve here tomorrow, and our quote is for Dr. Sellis uh, in tribute to him and his care for his patients. People don't care how much you know unless they know how much you care. And I know uh, Dr. Sellis certainly works on his relationships with his patients and connecting with them. And again, that quote, if you want to write it down, People don't care how much you know unless they know how much you care. Up next week, our first show of 2018, a uh, United captain uh, and a pilot. He's the owner of May Brothers Landscaping. My good friend Ted Dabney is coming up on next week's program. That is all, everyone, for this episode of Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. Go out and change the world for the better, and see you 2017.